Okay, um, so <clears throat> we're discussing um, asymptotic normality results, and these are um, basically extensions of the CLT. The so weak law of large numbers is a statement about convergence and probability of the sample mean to the population mean, which we can think of as um, basically the consistency of sample mean for the population mean. And then the CLT is an asymptotic normality for this estimator. Uh, and so what it says is that if we rescale properly, uh, the rescale deviations uh, relative to the limit are normally distributed. So we can use this information, or sorry, converges in distribution to normal. So approximately normal in distribution for large. And so we can use this information to build um, confidence and asymptotic confidence intervals. Uh, and so in order to provide uh, these type of results for a general estimator, uh, which is consistent, uh, we need to sort of develop some calculus uh, of working with the CLT and convergence, basically conversion and distribution, conversion and probability. So we went over uh, these basic properties. Uh, a very important one uh, is this is Slutsky's lemma and also continuous mapping lemma. Um, so if the sequence converges in the distribution to X, uh, a random variable, another sequence converges to a constant, then they jointly converge in distribution. Combined with continuous mapping, uh, this implies that, for example, sums or any con continuous combination of x1 and uh, xn and yn is, is going to converge to uh, the corresponding function of x and c pair. So, for example, we saw that um, so the sums converge, the products converge, um, like ratios. Uh, converge and so on. And we did an example of these uh, uh, to, to showcase these probability, uh, sorry, the, the properties. And we showed that um, for a general um, distribution, if you have an IAD sequence uh, from the distribution whose mean is mu and, and variance is sigma squared, um, we know that the sample mean is consistent for mu. Uh, and if you form this um, sample variance uh, and the corresponding sample covariance matrix, if, and if we normalize um, or standardize the sample mean, this is the standard procedure. So we subtract the mean and divide by um, an estimate of the standard deviation. So standard deviation of x bar n is sigma over root n. So we're replacing sigma with Sn, which is an estimate. Uh, so we use these properties to prove that this convergence distribution to a standard norm. Uh, so this result doesn't require any distribution assumption on the x. So we're not assuming that uh, xi's are normal or anything. And so we, we can use this result then to um, construct a confidence interval. And because we know that the probability that, for example, this is less than or equal to 1.96 in absolute value converges to the corresponding probability uh, for a normal random variable. And, and that probability is, let's say, 0.95. So we have an event in terms of this estimator and the true mu uh, that has high probability. And so we can rearrange and get a an, uh, confidence interval for mu, uh, which is an interval uh, basically an interval estimate that contains the true parameter with probability, uh, which is the desired level, usually high, high probability, as in those thinking. Okay, so that's one um, a very um, common application of these asymptotic results. Um, any questions? So this was a quick recap. Yes. I was wondering why the slides for consistency is zero of order. Um, yeah, so this is not very, um, this is not the standard. So it's my, so you can call it first order, second order, whatever order the first one is, the second is like one order higher. Um, 
what I'm thinking here is uh, in terms of uh, basically, um, um, why do I call it zero order? Um, uh, so one way of thinking about it is in terms of the Taylor expansion of the likelihood. So um, if you see the proof of asymptotic normality, you, you would do uh, a Taylor expansion and uh, like if it's the first order of Taylor expansion of the uh, likelihood. So by like interpolation, this is the zeroth order. Okay, so no, no Taylor expansion basically. At this point, we don't do any Taylor expansion. For asymptotic normality, you do a first order Taylor expansion, you could do a higher order Taylor expansion. So that's maybe one way. Um, but it's not a like a serious uh, like formal thing, so we can just ignore it. Um, okay, so any other questions? Okay, so I want to maybe state the result uh, for a general M estimator. We have an asymptotic normality result under some conditions, um, and we'll see if we, we can prove it later, but I'm going to maybe like go over everything uh, until the end so that you have everything for your homework problems. And if you have time, you come back and selectively prove uh, some of these statements. Um, so the, the other concept that we need for that result is this notion of uniform tightness or boundedness in probability. So we have conversion probability, conversion distribution. Uh, this is a similar notion. So there's no convergence here, but this um, uh, is the stochastic version of a bounded sequence. Okay, so if you have a sequence of random variables, uh, if they were deterministic, you know what bounded means. So if if, if n is large enough, um, I can contain them in a like an interval. Okay, so the idea here is um, similar, um, but there's a bit of a trickiness to it. So this is the formal definition, and and we're doing it for a um, vector sequence of random vectors, but you can think of them as um, random variables if you just replace this with uh, absolute value. So what this is saying is that for every epsilon, uh, there exists some M uh, such that um, the probability that the sequence of random variable is less than epsilon, sorry, bigger than M is less than epsilon basically uh, for all M simultaneously. So the supremum here is something like that. So it's saying that the probability that, uh, so this is um, say, um, bigger than M is less than epsilon, or you can say the probability that Xn is less than or equal to M is greater than or equal to one minus epsilon, okay? Uh, so what it's saying is that I can find uh, for every epsilon, I can find an interval and large enough such that um, all of these random variables uh, lie in this interval with probability at least one minus epsilon, with high probability, okay? Uh, it's not that some of them are going to like go to infinity. So this prevents the cases where, so basically the distribution of all these variables sort of put most of the mass in this interval, okay? So that's the notion of a uniformly tight uh, sequence of random variables. What is not uniformly tied is like a sequence of random variables that sort of whose distribution sort of moves like to one end, like to infinity. So the mass sort of escapes to infinity. So this prevents this from happening. So um, what this is not saying is convergence. So there's no need for this sequence to converge anywhere, but um, the distributions are basically contained to within a compact set uh, to any degree of accuracy you want. So if, if, if you pick an epsilon, uh, you can make this as close to one as you want. Um, so if you think about it, any single random variable is tight or uniformly tight. In that case, uniformly doesn't mean anything because any random variable, uh, because the distribution has to, like the mass has to die off. So if I, I pick an interval, I can make the interval large enough such that the tails of the distribution are small enough outside. So any single random variable, at least on the random variables that we look at are, are tight. So uniform tightness means this interval can be chosen independent of the 
where x and n is. Um, so independent of n, basically. Uh, so the fact that the single variable is height may fail in like infinite dimensional cases. But, but for our cases, every random variable, every random vector is tight uh, in the sense that I can um, just imagine just the sequence just contains one variable. So that always is true. But the sequence may not satisfy this because uh, individually, although individually they're tight, but I have to move this um, M around or basically have to maybe increase M as N grows to contain more and more of the uh, escaping mass. Okay, so that's the notion of unicorn tightness. It's really boundedness in indeterministic cases. So the, the probabilistic counterpart of boundedness is this. So you can think of it as a bounded sequence. So whatever properties you know, for example, you know that if you, a sequence is bounded and another sequence converges to zero, then the product of these two would converge to zero. Uh, so this is the statement. And if you translate probability, if a sequence converges in probability to zero, another sequence is uniformly tight, then the product is uh, converging to zero in probability. And this is often written as, so uniform tightness is written as big OP. So a sequence which is um, uniformly tight is written as um, being OP of one with big O. Little OP was the convergence to zero in probability. So this statement A, is saying that the sequence, which is a little op of one multiplied by a big op of one, produces a little op of one. Okay, so that's the um, like a mnemonic shorthand uh, for part A. Part B is also interesting. What it's saying is that if a sequence converges to in distribution to x, then that sequence is uniformly tight. Um, the converse is obviously not true, <clears throat> but this is also like intuitively clear. If the distributions are converging to a certain thing, then certainly the mass is going to be contained. So you can look at the mass of the limit. This limiting random variable is tight, and the distributions are approaching that. So you should be able to like uh, easily prove this statement. Okay. So these are the facts that we need about convergence or uniform tightness. Okay. Questions? Yeah. For the, the, the big part, it's all in one. All yeah. Simpler, more simpler, and smaller, much easier. For all n, yes. N. Yeah. Okay. Um, questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you're talking about this? Uh, so this? X and an X, so X is the limit. X n is the sequence. Right, so that's how you write. Conversion distribution really means the distribution of the C, like each one of them is converging to the distribution of X, but you write it in terms of random variables. It's very common, okay? Yeah. So then we don't need to choose like some sufficiently large. Uh, a very good question. Uh, and the answer is it doesn't matter. So if you define it that way, it would be equivalent to this. Why would it be equivalent? Because uh, so any finite number of them would be tight. So this is really a statement about the, the what happens after a certain point. So I can say, OK, for every epsilon, there exists an n naught such that if n is bigger than n naught, and then the m such that this holds. But this is, would be equivalent. Right. That follows from the fact that any finite sequence would be tight. Good, good, good question. Any other questions? So we really are going to use this if we start proving things. So I'm um, 
gonna be like glossing over it a little bit, yes. Uh, it doesn't say anything about the first moment. It just says well, that. So I, as I mentioned, any random variable, like real value random variable is tight, no matter if the moments exist or not. Even if like it's Cauchy distribution, like let's say a random variable has Cauchy distribution. Um, so the the expectation is like x px dx, right? Let's say this is a density respect to the bank, right? So this is this being finite is different than um, the mass dying off. So this 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 is telling the mass is dying off fast. Okay, there is a notion called uniform integrability, which is related to integrability on the tails, but this is weaker. Okay, so you don't need to, the mul multiplication by x makes it harder. Okay, so if I have something like one over um, what is the Cauchy, something like that. So you know that this integral will be infinite. Or like, no, let's say not infinite, but it does not exist because like it's infinite on the positive side, infinite on the negative side. It's like infinity minus infinity undefined. Um, but but this guy, you can see that the density dies down, there has to die down. And so I can I can take M large enough such that the mass that's at infinity is controlled. So it's, it's V here. So what you're looking at, if you want, check out uniform integrability. That's another technical condition, which is very often used in, 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 in this context, but we're not gonna use uniform integrability. Okay. Uh, so it's easier to call it boundedness. Um, okay, so there's another notion which I'm gonna skip because it's harder to digest and we're not gonna use it much. Um, it's called a stochastic equicontinuity. It's like the stochastic version of uh, a sequence of equicontinuous functions, which is probably something that you guys haven't, like most people have seen like continuity and maybe uniform continuity, but equicontinuity is something a little bit more uh, exotic. So uh, it's, it's like a statement about continuity of a class of functions. So a single function would be continuous if whenever that theta naught, if whenever theta is close to, like, for every epsilon, um, I can pick a delta such that if delta theta is close to theta naught, delta, like delta close to theta naught, then the values of the function are epsilon close. So uniform continuity says that I can choose this, for, epsilon, for every epsilon, I can choose this delta um, independent of the class. So there is one single delta that works for every f in the class. So then that class is uniform, like equicontinuous. It's a sort of uniform continuity, but they call it equicontinuous. So equicontinuous at theta naught, and this definition can be like properly adapted to the probabilistic setting. It would be something like that, which we skip, okay? So the point is, if a sequence of functions, random functions, so if a sequence of random functions is stochastically equicontinuous at the point, and if I have a sequence of random variables that converges to that point in probability, then I, if I evaluate that sequence of functions at this random theta hat n, that minus this fn theta naught converges to zero in probability. So this is a very useful result uh, because for example, this could be the likelihood, this could be the maximizer, I'm evaluating the likelihood at the maximizer. This could be a score function and I'm evaluating the score function at it's one of the zeros. And this would be the target that's converging to and this is saying the difference is negligible, okay? Uh, this is the key property that follows and is just a strong condition. Um, but it really matters when we go through the proof. So I'm gonna like, again, uh, briefly mention it and move on. If we end up going through the proof, I, I'll, I'll tell you exactly where this is needed. Um, it's important to deal with quantities like this. So you have a random function, a value to the random point that potentially depends on the function. So these things would be very hard to control. Suppose I maximize Mn, the maximizer is the likelihood, the, the max MME. And then I evaluate, for example, the score function or the, the likelihood at that point. So everything is very much dependent. And so this equation, stochastic equanimity allows me if I manage to prove it for the likelihood sequence or the score function sequence, 
or the derivative of the score function, that then it allows me to, to make statements like this. But let's see. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so Lipschitz continuity is um, is a property of a single function. Uh, it's a stronger notion of continuity for a single function. It's like somewhere between continuity and differentiability. It's like a smoothness condition. Um, so a Lipschitz condition, for example, implies uh, uniform uh, continuity. Uh, this is the property. It's, it's not as strong. Uh, it's not as strong as Lipschitz, uh, but it's strong in another direction. So you have a sequence of functions that they all at the same time are continuous. So it's it's a property of class function. Yes. So for the more complicated like convergence, it is closer to uniform convergence. But uniform convergence again is the property of a single function. But but it's very similar to this. So uniform that uniformity is over the range of theta. So you're saying it's uniformly continuous for a sequence, like a range of theta, if, if this epsilon delta choice doesn't depend on the choice of theta, um, this is at a single point, but across the other dimension, which is the functions. So these are all related. So the, 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 it's, an, it's a notion of uniform uniformity, but across functions. Um, yeah, if you had time, we go, we'll go to, but this is more of an advanced. Uh, so the, the book that I'm citing here, Convergence Stochastic Processes, it's a book about empirical process theory. So traditional empirical process theory, for example, uses this a lot. Um, I'm just pointing this out so that I can state the result and you see where one is one of the assumptions. If we end up like digging a little bit into, I'll talk about that, but um, let's, let's have that. So uniform tightness is good to know. The stochastic continuity is good to, uh, have heard about, but let's not worry too much. Um, so back to the M estimators. So that's the setting that we want to analyze. And uh, any any other questions, by the way, before? Uh, that yes, I didn't dwell too much on it. Uh, yeah. It's, Uh, so whenever you want to prove like uh, continuity, right? You'd say for every epsilon there exists a delta, let's say at the point, such that for all theta within then the delta neighbor the theta naught. So that's the role of data. So this has to hold for all. So this is saying basically for all theta close to this, this is less than epsilon, or the probability that's bigger than epsilon is central. So that's the epsilon delta definition. But because here we are probabilistic, this doesn't have to hold exactly, but the probability that it fails has to be small. So that's saying, uh, so you can say supremum over, okay, so if you want to dig it, dig into this, this, this is the deterministic statement, you can write it like that. So you can say supremum over all theta. In, so this, the fact that theta close to theta naught um, implies this, you can say this holds like supremum over this is bounded by, Epsilon. All right, so this statement can be written like a supremum, and that's the supremum that appears there. Um, but then the soup over the function is outside. So it's a technical definition, but if you. No, it's a different concept. Uniform convergence is a property of a single function. So this is trying to capture that idea, but you don't say a sequence of functions uniformly converge. The sequence of functions is equicontinuous at a point. Okay, it's not, it's not a, um, I don't know if there's an equiconvergence, but uh, we talk about like a sequence, like here we talk about sequence, but it's like a property of a class. You can say the entire class is equicontinuous. If you're looking at a sequence, you really want the tail, the tail of it to be equicontinuous. So this lean soup is like saying, ignore the first half, like the first few, uh, and like for any large n, that class is satisfying this property. Uh, okay, so back to the m estimator. So that's the thing that we want to analyze. Uh, I have an m and not m n theta, which is of this form. Um, Xi's are uh, iid from p theta naught, and 
Um, P theta naught is the true distribution, theta naught is the true parameter. And so we know, or at least we had the result, uh, that if mn is uniformly uh, uniformly converges, you remember, in probability, and there was an other condition about uh, the uniqueness of the maximizers of the limit, and then we have consistency. Now I want to like to to um, say something about as the normality of this. So this is basically an argument about Taylor extensions, and so we write um, the first derivative in theta um, with a dot again. Uh, if you remember the, um, the score function, we had the dot notation. So the first derivative with respect to theta of m theta of xi at theta naught, and then the second derivative with the double dot. So these are the quantities that appear in the result. And then double dot of m and theta is just the second derivative of this, which is going to be the average of these second derivative of these um, basic functions. So with this notation, um, this is the result. Um, so if theta naught is in the interior of the parameter space, and if these four conditions hold, um, then um, this is the, the final result, ignore the second one. So this is saying that uh, theta hat n, the, the, M, the M estimator, uh, is asymptotically normal. So it has an asymptotic normal distribution similar to the CLT. Uh, this is the limit would be normal with mean zero, and this is the covariance matrix, okay? So what are these matrices? I'll maybe go through the uh, argument. So the first assumption is uh, M theta naught dot, uh, the expectation is zero. So what this notation means is really, um, let me do, um, so this is a shorthand notation for, so what I mean by this is really um, expectation m dot theta naught x1. Okay, we want this to be zero. Um, so is this reasonable? Um, yes, because the like the prototypical example is we really want to use it for mainly um, log likelihood, right? Or, or we, we call this L theta, uh, if you remember. So this is really, in that case, so example, in that case is really saying the, um, do I have a theta? So, so the expectations are under the true parameters. So I'm not putting it, but if you want, there's a theta naught here, which I'm ignoring. So under the real uh, parameter. So this is saying that expectation of the score function is zero which is one of the properties that we sort of established under the regularities in, in, in the um, discussion of the kramer album Okay, so under those regularities, so this is valid under regularities for the, or holds for the score, like for the likelihood. Uh, the second, uh, okay, so this is true. And then S theta naught is, um, we're going to assume that this is well defined, which means that the second moments exist. Okay, so that's the this guy, um, and and so if there's zero mean, so this is again um, these are all functions of x. So this is really this, and you recognize this in the case of um, the log likelihood. What would this quantity be? This is, this is going to be efficient information. So in the example, uh, this turns out to be, this is really the covariance of this uh, under the first assumption. So S theta would be the efficient information matrix. Okay, for the ML. So that's the first condition. So basically we want, uh, in the case, the, the equivalent of the score, the zero mean and the covariance to exist, covariance matrix. And then we want the double dot so the second derivative to be integrable and uh, a strictly negative definite, okay? So this condition B basically um, is saying that we want this quantity um, to be a strictly 
uh, negative definite. And, and first exists, and then the, basically the expectation exists. So in the case of the MLE, what would this be? Sorry? Uh, this is the Hessian of the log likelihood, but what is the expectation of the Hessian, if you remember? The Hessian of the log likelihood. Uh, in the exponential family, um, and so in the exponential family, everything is basically related to the log partition function. Yes, yeah, so it would be like the Hessian. That would be the Hessian of the log partition function that you're thinking about. I'm talking about the log. So it's yeah. So because yeah, um, in the exponential family, if you take the log, there's a linear term, and then there's the log partition function. If you take second derivative, the linear term goes away. So the second derivative of the log likelihood is really uh, the negative of the Hessian of the log partition function. It's true, but I'm, I'm asking more generally. So in the exponential family, this, the expectation is sort of not needed because it's going to be constant. Uh, but generally, there is a there is a relation. So you remember, there's there was like just just replace it with L theta. It's almost, it's like the negative. It's negative. In that case, the example, this would be negative. And we know that the Fisher information is positive definite. So if the Fisher information is invertible, it would be strictly positive, like negative definite. So negative definite means like things are concave. So it's like the, we talked about this. So uh, if you look at this function, uh, the second derivative being negative means like you're having a well-defined maximum. Um, so that's what you want, basically. So this is true uh, for non-singular models. Basically, the Fisher information had, does not have zero eigenvalues. Uh, but but again, this this result is more general. But what I'm I'm just um, giving you consequences for the MLE. So that will be v theta naught in this notation. The second, the third condition is that theta hat and is consistent for theta naught that we have to establish elsewhere. Assume that you have established it elsewhere. Uh, and then the last one is that the second derivative of this MN, this capital MN, is equally continuous of theta naught. That's the technical condition, okay, which we're going to ignore unless we have to deal with it. Okay, so that's a technical condition, assuming that this is true for a reasonable model. Uh, then this is the result. So what the result is saying is that under these conditions, uh, I would have root N. Uh, Theta hat n minus theta naught converges in distribution to normal, which means zero. And a covariance matrix, which is uh, v theta naught inverse, s theta naught, and v theta naught inverse. Okay. So, what does this say in the case of for the MLE? We know what these matrices are. So, what do I get? You get the yeah, negative inverse of the Fisher, and then the, the Fisher itself, and the negative inverse of the Fisher, which would be it would, not negative, but yeah, it should be covariance mix. So it has to be positive definite. So the, the inverse of the Fisher. So what this is saying that under these regularity assumptions, which hopefully hold the MLE. Your consistent MLE is as emphatically normal with mean zero and covariance matrix, which is the inverse of the Fisher information. So in 1D, what it's saying is that root n theta at n minus theta and just zero, one over. Um, we also wrote it as like this, if you remember. But that kind of be like, like that. Theta now. Okay, so this is the final result. And so this result not only gives you asymptotic normality, but it tells you what the asymptotic covariance of variance is. So does this look familiar, this type of variance? Sorry? Yeah, okay. So what this is saying is uh, if you rearrange this, uh, what this is really saying. 
So this is asymptot as an asymptotic result. So what this is saying that for large n, uh, root n theta hat n minus theta is approximately distributed like normal. Then I can say theta hat n minus theta. This is very approximate. This is not exact. I just want you. This is what classical statisticians sort of argued, and then half a century tried to make it precise. Like half a century of statistics was trying to make this argument precise. So, uh, so if I multiply by root n both sides, this is going to get. Um, if let's say this is normal, this is the, this has this distribution. What will be the distribution of this? I'm dividing it by uh, one over root n. Then I change the variance. You get n Fisher information, right? And then I can rearrange. So theta hat n would be approximately normal with mean theta naught. So this very heuristic argument suggests that asymptotically, uh, this will have the correct mean. So we'll say you will we'll say theta hat n is unbiased for theta naught asymptotically. It's not unbiased necessarily. But asymptotically unbiased because so you can see like if, if this was true, then this would be the mean. And then the variance would be asymptotically what the Kramer Rao bound suggests. Because we are dealing, remember, we are dealing with n IID samples. So the Fisher information of the whole model is n times the Fisher information of one. So this i theta naught that appears here is the Fisher information of one sample. Okay, because all of these are based on a single sample. From the start, you remember we had the reduction from n to one, uh, but the Fisher information of the entire x1 up to xn is n times the Fisher information of one. So th this is what they're saying is asymptotically, theta hat n is unbiased and achieves the best variance. So it achieves the Kermit Rao bound. So it's like asymptotically u and u, but we don't we don't say u and u. Asymptotically, we'll say asymptotically efficient. So MLE is asymptotically. efficient. Okay, because it, it achieves the Kramer Rao bound asymptotically. Okay, so let's understand this first. And I'll tell you why this is problematic. But yeah. Right, here's, um, yeah, this is for the more general M estimators. For the MLE, it reduces to this. Uh, are there other estimators for which you get this? Maybe. We're not saying that, but, but what, what happens to other estimators? But at least for the MLE, this is what happens. Yes. So the reason why I stated it is because uh, there's nothing uh, in this result that requires you to work with the MLE. So it works for any M estimator. It's just that the, uh, the form of this covariance matrix turns out to be that. In the case of the MLE, it's interesting because they're all like variance of the Fisher information, so things simplify. Okay. So the, the significance of this classically is that MLE is efficient. Efficient means like it has the smallest possible variance. Um, so why people like worry too much about this because none of this is true. It's like all of this is heuristic argument. So kramer raubahn is not as in as emphatic result. So we just proved it for a fixed model. You can't say that necessarily if things converge, this, this variance has to be lower bounded by anything. And in fact, there is a case, uh, I have a slide there, which we skip, we'll skip. We can construct estimators that beat this easily, like at a single point. So they're called super efficient estimators. So there's no guarantee that this is a lower bound as emphatically. The other thing is, uh, so this these are all heuristic approximations. So there's no, so there's, uh, even I, I can't guarantee that the expectation exists. Okay, so if you have a conversion distribution, there's no reason that the means would converge. So you can have a sequence of random variables of conversion distribution to something, but the means of like the moments don't do not converge. So that's where that e like uniform integrability is sort of is needed. So uh, all of this here is heuristic, and basically we could be very far away for any given n. Uh, this approximation might be very far from the truth. But there has been a lot of attempts in classical statistics, theoretical statistics too, 
try to make sense of in what sense then it seems like showing something uh, can we make it precise is this like argument can can it be made precise in a certain way mm -hmm. and so this would be a second course in classical asymptotic statistics which we don't uh, teach so we're gonna leave it at that just just remember that this is uh, there, there are a lot of caveats okay and there, there has been a lot of effort people put into trying to make sense of this which nowadays are uh, out of fashion mm -hmm. but uh, if you're interested you can look into asymptotic um, uh, the statistics by Van der Waart, and it goes into the great detail, uh, like the attempts trying to make sense of these uh, kind of efficiency. But roughly speaking, uh, MLE is optimal in a sense, asymptotically, okay, because it sort of has the right uh, looking variance, okay, small as possible. Sounds good. Uh, so we had a formula. Remember, there was a formula that told, told you under the regularity assumptions of uh, the Kramer Rao bound that we can interchange integral and differentiation. Uh, then the, there were two equivalent expressions for the Fisher information. Okay. Uh, either like you take the score function squared or score function transpose expectation, that's like the covariance of the score function, or the second derivative of the log language, which is the, the first derivative of the score function, the expectation of that. So I had like a slide go back, uh, and you can also verify it in practice. So you had this expectation of L theta. L theta transpose is equal dot is equal to expectation of negative L double dot theta and both equal to I theta. Okay. We didn't necessarily prove it, but it's a known fact uh, under those regularities. Under the regularity assumptions that we make. So almost always true in this course. Yes. Not generally. Everything requires some sort of assumptions. But the assumptions that I made about like interchange of uh, derivative, uh, you can try to prove it for yourself. So if, if you can differentiate, uh, then you should be able to figure out how to prove this. If you can differentiate under, under the integral. Okay. Um, maybe I should assign it as a whole problem. But you can interchange the differentiation with theta, respect to theta and integration or expectation, then this should follow. Other questions? Okay, so we're going to skip the proof for now, depending on how much time we have. We'll come back and do a selective proof depending on how uh, much of interest you guys have in proving various statements. But the idea, the general idea is, is um, I'm going to mention, you just do a Taylor expansion. So we know that theta hat n is a maximizer of mn. And by assumption, we know that the theta naught is in the interior. So that was one of the assumptions. Uh, this is this is theta. This should I should probably point out as a separate assumption, because theta naught is in the interior, and we assume that theta hat n is consistent. Uh, for large enough n with high probability, I'm going to be in the interior. So the estimate was in the interior, and if you have a, a function which is differentiable, you're maximizing it, and you know that the maximum occurs in the interior, the derivative has to vanish, or the gradient has to vanish. If things are at the boundary, then you have to worry about, okay, maybe there's a direction that I don't have to vanish, but in the interior, in, in all directions, I shouldn't be able to move down. So the gradient has to vanish. And so that's the sort of local optimality condition. So you, you set the first derivative equal to zero, and then you expand m and theta, m and theta, m and dot. Uh, so you take the second derivative. So this is the Taylor expansion. Taylor expansion of this, first order Taylor expansion of the score, you can think of it as the average score function or the score equation if you've seen it in the 
more problems for, for the MLE would be the score. So you do the expansion and there is a second derivative that you have to calculate at an intermediate point. And this is where stochastic equity continuity comes in to take care of this. Uh, this one of them is zero, so this is zero. This would be controlled by the law of large numbers because it's gonna be an average and you do some calculation and you end up proving that result. Okay, so there is a bunch of use of the continuous mapping theorem, the law of large numbers, CLT, and the use of OP notation. It's a very good exercise. So if you have time, we'll come back. Um, and then just the entire thing is just two pages, but let's move on. And this, this slide talks about uh, uh, conditions for stochastic equicontinuity, if you're interested. Uh, so that's the conclusion that we got for the MLE. Uh, one of these matrices is I, the other is negative I, and I get this, uh, that MLE as an emphatically efficient. So this is the punchline, which you all should know. And uh, the argument is interesting, but to a lesser degree, it's just a Taylor expansion argument, which is majority of classical statistics sort of runs on Taylor expansion. And um, what they're saying is like as emphatically cheap, uh, Taylor the row bound. Um, this is the example, again, we skip. Called Hodge's super efficient example, where you can manipulate any estimator to have uh, that, that has a certain variance, asymptotic variance. So let's say I have an estimator uh, for which I have a particular asymptotic variance. I can construct another estimator out of it by re like um, what you do is um, in, in a region where theta had t t delta n is n to the negative one fourth, you scale it down by a factor. Uh, and this this can achieve an asymptotic variance like this uh, at um, uh, any point, uh, any particular. I can I can make it zero at any point by by taking a to be zero. I can force the asymptotic statistic to be zero at any point that I want. So I can beat the kramer rao bound at least at one point, whatever point I want. So this this example that you can work out for yourself. This is the uh, they call it shrinkage estimator because you shrink when delta n is small. Given any delta that has a certain, let's say I, I start with the MLE, this is going to be i, one over i theta. Uh, I just shrink it when the value of theta hat n is small. Uh, I can set it equal to zero even. And then that would have a smaller variance at that point. And then the same variance at every other point. Yes. Um, so the original one could be biased as well. So the thing is that uh, this will have the same asymptotic distribution, so the mean would be zero, and the variance would be smaller. Uh, both can be biased, but, but both are asymptotically unbiased. So you're talking about asymptotic bias. So asymptotic bias is whatever appears here. And in this case, it would be zero. Um, because that one has like asymptotic mean zero. So, uh, okay. Uh, so I'll let you think about this if you want. This is not difficult to prove. This n negative, n to the negative one fourth is to avoid altering the distribution everywhere else except at that point you call theta equal to zero. Um, okay, uh, the next thing that I wanna, so, there, there are three main results. One was about the consistency. The other was asymptotic normality. Um, and then there's this final result, which is in the same category as proven by the Taylor expansion again. Uh, it's called the delta method. It gives you another way of establishing asymptotic normality results outside that M estimator business. Um, and so what this is saying, uh, in, in short, like simple terms, let me do it maybe in the one univariate case. Uh, suppose I have, for example, a sequence of estimators that converge, let's say, like this. Suppose I have um, this convergence to something. Um, now I have another estimator, which is f hat, uh, f of theta hat n. Okay, so let's say these are all a scalar. Uh, so for, for example, I have theta hat n. Now I want to like form a, like a, like let's say theta hat n squared. So I'm going to predict maybe theta squared, okay? By the, for example, let's say, 
f is um, let's say f is differentiable uh, at theta. Okay, uh, so we know by because it's going to be also continuous that this is going to converge uh, in distribution and probability, right, to f of theta. Why? By, by the continuous mapping here. Because it's differentiable, it's going to be continuous. And so uh, we know that's going to be, so f theta hat n is going to be consistent for f theta. Um, so then the next question is, that, is it going to be asymptotically normal as well? And so this delta method uh, comes in and says, yes, this is also going to be asymptotically normal. And uh, what will be the variance? The variance would be the derivative of this function at theta times, then you'd get that, okay? Uh, so more, more generally, if this is converging to a random variable z, uh, this is going to converge to the random variable f prime theta times z. So you just rescale the distribution of z by the derivative of theta, f at theta. This is called the delta method, and it's a very powerful method. So for example, if I have uh, x bar n, so this, 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 we have the sequence uh, iid, so x1 dot 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 xn iid uh, with uh, normal. Actually, they don't need to be normal. The iid from some distribution, and then the expectation of uh, let's say x1 is mu, like this, so the variance is. Uh, let's say one, okay? So I know that x bar n converges to mu and I have by CLT something like, uh, like this, okay? Then for example, this delta method says, if I, for example, form x bar n a squared, it's gonna be, we saw this, for example, in that example that we did, we needed something like that. So this is gonna be consistent for mu, uh, moreover, this is going to be asymptotic normal at the same rate. Uh, normal would mean zero and variance, which would be, in this case, f of x would be x squared. So I have f prime, oh, sorry, this, this would be squared. Uh, sorry, when the f prime times this, if, if, if this was a standard no, normal, when I multiply this, I multiply the variance by, by square of that. So f of x would be uh, 2x. So this would be uh, f prime of mu. Uh, squared um, uh, times one, right? So it would be normal, which means zero variance for mu squared, if you haven't done any mistake. So any very interesting result that allows you to, to drive asymptotic normality results almost for free. If you can differentiate, you get uh, a result, and this is another application of the Taylor expansion, um, but is the sort of idea here. Okay, very powerful method. It's very much useful for what, what they call plug-in estimators. So this is a type of plug-in. So if I have an estimator of theta, I want to estimate f theta, I can plug into that function. So this gives you uh, basically asymptotic normality of plug-in estimators. Normality of Okay, so um, the statement, the more general statement is stated here. So we don't really need root n here. So whatever sequence here would work as long as it goes to infinity. Uh, and then xn could be a vector, theta could be a vector, this could be a vector. Um, f would, in that case, be a multivariate map. So let's say a, from, for example, x is in Rd, f maps to Rk, then the derivative would really be a Jacobian matrix. And so each component of f with respect to each component of the input, so that j theta is a matrix. And so the limit would be that matrix, that's the linear transformation. So that linear transformation times the limiting uh, random variable. So for example, if Z is 
for example, is, is if it's normal, which means zero and covariant sigma, then this guy, uh, J theta Z would be normal which means zero, covariance J theta sigma, J theta transpose. Okay, it tells you the asymptotic uh, covariance. Um, so start, for example, from the MLE, that would be like the inverse of the Fisher information. You do some transformation, it just is reflected in, in the limit, just in the covariance of the asymptotic covariance via the Jacobian of the transpose. Um, sounds good. Okay, so we're very close to finishing this chapter. So this is another result which I am gonna skip the proof, but once you see one of these proofs, then actually the, the, the consistency proof is different, but the proof of the delta method and uh, the asymptotic, basically asymptotic normality results all rely on a Taylor expansion. Uh, so you, you, you do a Taylor expansion around the true parameter and, and, and then you're done. So maybe I'll do it um, if you get a chance, but uh, so let's see an example here. So I, did, I think I already did this. X bar n uh, is um, asymptotically normal in general for uh, a distribution which has mean mu and, and variance sigma squared. Uh, and so um, if I do uh, this t squared, I get um, that this converges to f prime times normal. So it would be, uh, we already did this. Um, the only issue is when mu is zero. So when mean is zero, I get the normal distribution of mean zero and the variance, which is also zero. Uh, so that result is still correct but it just predicts that this is converging in distribution to a zero random variable, which is fine. So it's saying conversion probably to zero. So this is gonna be a good result uh, everywhere except at zero, because it predicts that this root n is not enough. So I'm multiplying by root n, this is still converging to zero. So it's converging to zero faster than I expected. So what do we do in, in that context? You go to the proof of the delta method, you do like a second order Taylor expansion. Because what happens here is that the derivative has vanished. Maybe the second derivative is non zero. So if you do the Taylor expansion, the first third term would go away. The second term remains. And uh, you can show, for example, in that case, that uh, instead if I multiply, so this is zero, if I multiply by n, uh, this would converge to something stable, in this case, chi squared. And in this case, you can easily see that that's true, for example, if. Um, if you use a, a continuous mapping theorem, because we know, for example, that uh, root n x bar n divided by sigma, we know that this is, because the mean is zero, this is converging to normal between zero and one. And by continuous mapping, this has to converge uh, to, in this distribution, to normal zero, one squared. Uh, which is really uh, just chi squared one. So in this case, by hand, you know that this happens. So this is saying, if you, if you rearrange n times x bar n squared, inversion and distribution to sigma squared, chi squared one. So this is saying that the order of conversion is faster, faster than n. So basically this minus zero is going to something you state, rather than multiplying by root n, I have to multiply by n to make it like larger because it's like going to zero at the rate one over n rather than one over root n, which is the standard rate. Okay, so this is a typical example, but you can rewrite the Taylor expansion in that case uh, and then have a, like a delta method, second order delta method, and so on. Sounds good? So this delta method is very useful very useful and very easy to use once you get a hang of it. And so this is another example which uh, you can do for yourself just for the Bernoulli. Uh, this is the case, the general case where the derivative vanishes, you can do the Taylor expansion, um, but um, skip that. Um, any any question about the, this example maybe before? Okay, so there's also not, it's, it's not limited to J 
just a single variable. As I mentioned, it works in a multivariate case and the multivariate version is really powerful. So for example, I can figure out the asymptotic distribution of the sample variance, okay? which is something non-trivial. Uh, we know that we showed that this converges in distribution to um, the variance, right? Or in, in probability. But how do I calculate the asymptotic distribution? Um, so what we do is we start from this random variable or random vector. So this is an average of uh, uh, a bunch of IID random vectors. Okay, so XI on top of XI squared. So this is a random vector and these are IID. So um, I calculate the, um, so we know that for example, one over N summation I from one to N uh, XI divided by, let's say something like that, uh, XI divided by XI squared, this minus the expectation of one of them, which is like expectation of X1, so the expectation of this vector, basically. So that's the mean. If I subtract the mean, this is the sample mean minus the expectation times root n. This converges in, in distribution to normal zero one with some covariance matrix. Okay. So I have this. This is the CLT. This is the multivariate CLT, right? So this is, uh, in other words, this is expectation. Uh, think of this as zi vector. This is the expectation of z one. And this is the multivariate CLT. Okay, and this is a two by two matrix. So what happens now is I define a function. So we know that this is uh, mu and then mu squared plus sigma squared. That's the second moment. So I have something like that. I from one to n x i. I can do it like this. Uh, one over n summation x i, i from one to n and then one over n summation i from one to n xi squared, and minus this root n converges in distribution to normal, mean zero, covariance sigma. Uh, so if I look at this squared, uh, it's just uh, the first element of this, right? Uh, or the second element, uh, minus the first. So i from one to n xi squared minus uh, one over n summation i from one to n x i squared. So if I define a function f of x y that takes the second argument minus the first argument squared, um, and if I apply this to this vector, I get my my desired result. So this would be, I really want to get something like this. So f applied to, I'm going to write it like this: x bar n. That's the first coordinate. X bar x n like x2 bar n. So that's to avoid writing this. So this is x bar n. This is x2 bar n. So if I apply it to that, uh, this, this side would be uh, f of mu and mu squared plus sigma squared. Uh, and this side would be by the um, delta method j uh, times sigma j transpose, they, where j is the Jacobian of this transformation. Okay, so this is really, you know that this is because of the way we define this would be this minus the squared would be sigma squared. And this is really going to be s squared. So what we showed is this converges to normal zero, zero, j sigma j transpose. And j here is... Uh, it's like one by two, this would be, because we have it, like uh, this maps from R2 to R. So we have one component, two derivatives. So it would be like partial of F with respect to X, partial of F with respect to Y. So that would be uh, negative two X, uh, one, okay. And then I have to evaluate this at the parameter of interest, which in, in this case, it's, uh, uh, what is the parameter of interest, basically? Okay. Uh, is there any question? No, no, okay. So uh, what would be, uh, so we are evaluating it at, at this, so this would be at theta. This is our theta. 
So it would be like mu, and if I'm not wrong, uh, so that that's the theta that I'm, I'm, I'm like applying f to, right? I'm ev evaluating this f at this theta. So my x would be in this case mu. So this is really, if I haven't made any mistake, they would, I might have made a mistake, but this is going to be uh, something like that. Okay, so the end result is like root n, s n squared minus sigma squared. Conversions in this division to normal would mean zero. And this would be negative two mu one. Uh, there is this covariance matrix that you have to calculate, uh, but this comes from the CLT. And then the transpose of this, which is that. So what is this covariance matrix? This is, uh, this you have to go to the CLT, right? The multivariate CLT, this is really uh, the covariance matrix of this V1. Okay, the covariance matrix of Z1, which is, which is going to be like the moments of Z, X up to fourth moment. So you need the fourth moments, right? So this is like a univariate quantity. So a Richter, this is really the covariance of Z1. So it turns out that the covariance of Z1 would depend on the moments of X1 up to fourth moment. So this would be like a matrix in terms of the fourth moment of the underlying distribution. But you can calculate it in, in principle for any given distribution. Um, and actually, you can exactly write it. So it would be like the first moment, second moment, third moment, fourth moment. So like a mixture of those would appear here. Okay, so those moments and then the first moment you multiply, you get a very non-trivial asymptotic result for. And then you can build confidence interval for Sn squared, if you like. Um, if you want, you can take a root. I can take a root of this. That's another delta method. Right? What if I do root n? Then I get the derivative of the, uh, let's call this function g, root x. So I get g prime x, sorry, g prime sigma squared, uh, squared times whatever this was. So I can do all these transformations. I can I can tell you how the asymptotic variance changes. Okay, so you can build confidence central for that, for this, for whatever you want. Sounds good. So it's really a fun tool to use, uh, and it often leads to very non-trivial results, especially the multivariate case. So for example, uh, I don't know if I assigned it, you can try to calculate the asymptotic variance, or like asymptotic, provide an asymptotic normality result for the correlation coefficient, which is even more complicated. So it's like uh, you have the bivariate uh, distribution. You look at the expectation of the coordinates and then divide by the variances, uh, and you can transform it into like a nonlinear function of averages. Um, and from there, you can, like, if, if you do some work, you get a very nice result, asymptotic result for the correlation, example correlation coefficient using this technology. Uh, okay, questions? Yes. So you can pr produce the same kind of uh, argument, but instead of the variance, sample variance, you can have a sample correlation between, so each each of your data points would be like x i y i, and you can form. Let's say there's zero mean for simplicity, so you can compute the average like one over n summation x i y i divided by root summation x i squared times summation y i squared. So you can think of this as a nonlinear function of these averages, three averages, and so you start from uh, something like one over n summation i from 1 to n, x i y i, x i squared, y i squared. So by CLT, this converges. Let's say everything is 0. Um, this would be minus 0, sigma x squared, sigma y squared, uh, root n, converges to normal between 0 and a three-dimensional, like 3 by 3 covariance matrix. And then there's a nonlinear function that maps this to the sample correlation. And then you do the calculation, you get a very nice expression for asymptotic or like variance of a sample correlation coefficient.
Maybe I'll talk about this late, later next time. But we have a few slides we, we didn't manage to finish. There is one other, like there are two, two uh, use, uses of these entire normalities. One is that entire relative efficiency, which you can hopefully read. There are a couple of questions related to this. I'm going to come back next time and talk about it. And the other one is constructing confidence intervals, which we have already seen. But I'm going to talk about that as well. And then this chapter would be finished. OK, so we have a couple more things to do from this chapter. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so hopefully we continue next time. And then the last chapter would be about uh, hypothesis testing. So let's see how things go.